So if we want to find the change in the output, we know that the change in the output is always going to be a matrix of derivatives, or a matrix of slopes, or rates of changes, times a vector of changes in input. So for example, in this function, this function has um, one output. So that means the matrix is going to have one row. And there are two inputs, x and y. So the matrix will have two columns. And in those columns, then let's see, df is going to be this total derivative matrix. In those columns, we just put the partial derivatives. But what's the rate of change of this function in the direction of x, which would be, let's see, 6x. And that goes in the first entry. And in the second entry, we have the rate of change with respect to y. So that's going to be negative 8y plus 1. Now, since this is the rate of change with respect to x, it should get multiplied by the change in x. Since this is the rate of change with respect to y, we would take the, the slope in the y direction times the change in y. And together, those two would give us the change in the output. OK, now if we were going to use this, say, to find the, the tangent space, um, <clears throat> we would need to have a particular point so that we would know what the slopes are at that particular point. So we could say find. Find the tangent space. In this case, since, since this is a surface, this is going to be the tangent plane that we'll find at, let's find, let's find it at a particular point, maybe at the point x equals 1 um, and um, y equals 2. So in that case, let's see, f of 1, 2 is 5 plus 3. Um, 2 squared is 4, so that's going to be uh, 4y squared will be minus 16 plus 2. So there's 8 minus 16. That's negative 8 plus 2 is negative 6. So the change in f then is going to be, um, let's maybe call this the output variable. Let's call it z instead of just the name of a function. So z minus minus 6. So because at 1, 2, our function's at negative 6. So if we move, if we uh, change the inputs, we should move away from negative 6. That would be the change in z. At 1, 2, the slope in the x direction is 6. And the slope in the y direction is negative 16 plus 1, which would be negative 15 times the change in x. That's how far x moves away from the center point 1 and how far y moves away from its center point 2. If we put that together, then we have z plus 6 equals um, 6 times x minus 1 minus 15 times y minus 2. You recognize that this is the equation of a plane. Let's graph the function. Um, that's a surface. And then we have this plane. Let's graph those two together and see what we get. So here's maple. We've got our, let's, uh, let's load our plotting package, so with plots. And then we're going to use going to make two plots, a plot of the original nonlinear function. So I'll call that p1 for plot 1. It's going to be plot 3d. Our function is 5 plus 3 times x squared minus 4 times y squared plus y. And just make sure that we contain the region where x equals 1. So let's see, let's go maybe from x equals 0 to 2. We need to contain the region where y equals 2. So let's let y equal 1 to 3. And there's our first plot. And the second plot will be like it. So I'll just copy that and paste it down here. P2, we figured out that the linearization is 6 times x, 6 times x minus 1 minus 15 times y minus 2 um, minus 6. I'll plot those two in the same region. I need to delete out this part. There we go. OK, so finally we'll display P1 and P2 together. Now when I plot the two, I get um, the function. You can see the function is, is nonlinear here. It's the one that's curvy. And then the plane, and that plane is doing its best approximating right at the center, which we located at uh, x equals 1, y equals 2. Let's do another example of finding a differential. And this time our function is vector valued. So there are, there are two inputs, r and theta, but there are also two outputs. You could think about these outputs as being maybe x and y, if you like. So we could look at the changes in output. The change in the output x and the change in the output y is going to be the total derivative matrix. Since there are two outputs, there will be two rows in this matrix. And since there are two inputs, there will be two columns. So 
if we're going to multiply this by the change in r and the change in theta, then the things in the first column should be rates of change with respect to r, because those are the things that are going to multiply dr. The things in the second column should be rates of change with respect to theta, because those are the ones that are going to be multiplying the change in theta. So the derivative of x with respect to r is cosine theta. The derivative of y with respect um, to r is sine theta. And then the derivative of x with respect to theta, since the derivative of cosine theta is negative sine theta, we get minus r sine theta. And the derivative of y with respect to, say, to theta is r cosine theta. <clears throat> so we have our change in outputs, right, is the slope matrix this time. We call that the total derivative, right, this 2 by 2 matrix times this vector of changes in, in inputs. OK, so let's see how we could use that. Now, one way we could use it is um, if we were at a particular location, um, theta and r, and we were thinking about what will happen if I change um, change r or change theta, what will happen to the outputs? Then we could put all that in here, right, and we get an approximation for how much the outputs would change. So we could just use this differential to approximate the change in outputs from the change in inputs. Another thing that we could do would be to um, calculate, the, calculate the, the function, the best linear approximation of this function, which we would call the tangent line, um, or let's see, which we would call, yeah, the tangent space in this case. So. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. This is a transformation, isn't it? We can think about this as the, the transformation from, um, from polar coordinates to um, Cartesian coordinates, x, y. So you, you put in an angle, an angle and a radius, and out comes an x and a y location. So what will happen if we make a small change in r, or if we make a small change in theta, or if we make small changes in both of them? What, what kind of changes will, will occur to x and y there? We can also find the tangent approximation, though. Let's just do it. Um, let's find find the linearization, or we could call that the tangent space, the linearization. Um, let's do it near r equal 2 and theta equal pi fourths. OK. So now that we know where r and theta are, we can actually figure out the particular values of the slope of the different slopes that we have at this location. So we get that, um, let's see, when r equals 2, then um, X is um, x is going to be two times the cosine of pi fourths, which is root two over two. So x is going to be root two, and y is going to be r, which is two times the sine of pi fourths, which is also root two over two. So y is also um, root two. So we could we could use this now to get the the equations of the linearization or tangent space. So x minus square root of 2 and y minus square root of 2. That's the change in x and the change in y. Let's find our slopes at our particular location. Let's see. If theta is pi fourths, the cosine is root 2 over 2. The sine is also root 2 over 2. And then we have minus 2 root 2 over 2. And oops, minus 2 root 2 over 2. And then here we have uh, 2 times root 2 over 2. So this one is root 2 times the change in r. So we're measuring how far does r move away from the center point 2, and how much does theta move away from pi fours. So if we multiply that out, we get a linear function for x and a linear function for y. The function for x is root 2 over 2 times r minus 2. Um, and then this is uh, negative root 2, so minus root 2 uh, times theta minus pi fours. And then over here, I'm supposed to have an x minus root 2. So I'll just move it over here to x plus, x plus root 2. Now, that, now x, this is a linear function for x in terms of r and theta. It's, it's not as complicated as the original, right? It's just the best line to, appro to the best linear function to approximate x near that point to pi fourths. Similarly, for y, let's see, we're going to get root 2 over 2 times r minus 2. And then we're going to get plus root 2 times theta minus pi fourths. Um, again, if I have this y minus root 2, I'm going to move the root 2 over here. So we find the best linear approximation to this function. This is the, this is the tangent space now. Um, so although this is, a, this is a complicated transformation, right? Near the point 2 pi fours, it's basically this linear function if you don't move too far away from where r equals 2 and theta equals pi fours. 
So we started off with this nonlinear function, and now we have converted its linearization. I'll just call it bold L. So these, this was our original equation for x and y, and now we have, um, it doesn't look much simpler, but it's actually linear, right? Because it's just a constant times r and a constant times theta, and then we could collect all that into a single constant. So um, it's actually a linear function for x, and now a linear function for y. Now we can actually see what this linearization is doing, because remember the original capital, or bold F there, that is the transformation from polar into Cartesian. So we, we can think about what that transformation does. From polar, if you fix R, a line of constant R turns out to be a circle, right? Now, if we fix r in this case, then this becomes a constant. And we have x is negative root 2 times theta, and y is positive root 2 times theta. That means, um, that, means that we have a line. You could, that's a parameterization of a line now. And that line has slope negative 1. So at our particular location, if this is where r equals 2, what we're getting when we fix, instead of fixing r and getting a circle, we get the line that is tangent. Oops, I missed. But anyway, that's the line that is tangent to the circle right there. Also, if we fix theta, so in the original transformation, if you fix theta, you get a line of constant angle. So if we fix theta at pi force, then we get, a, we get an angle, we get a line at this constant angle right through the, right through the origin, right? This is the, the line where theta equals pi force, because you're facing pi force, and then you can walk forward or backward as much as you want. OK, so you can see that um, if we fix theta in the linearization, then this becomes a constant, and that becomes a constant. And then we just have a line. x is um, root 2 over 2 times r, and y is root 2 over 2 times r plus a constant. And so that makes a line um, that has slope 1. OK, so in um, the original transformation, then all lines of constant r then become circles. And so if you put in more lines of constant r, when you transform those lines of constant r, they become circles. But in, in the linearization, you always get lines that have slope negative 1, which is not exactly the same thing, except for if you look right near our location where we found the linearization at 2 pi force, then actually the line of constant r is tangent to the line of constant r on the original nonlinear function. Um, lines of constant theta, then, normally those become different lines through the origin with the nonlinear transformation, but they all become lines with slope 1 in this case. So it's much different, except for if you look at this region um, near the point where r equals 2 and theta equals pi fours, actually the, the line of constant theta for the linearization or for the nonlinear function, those actually align, right? So it's basically just taking this um, complicated nonlinear transformation that takes some lines to circles and some through, and some lines, like lines of constant theta, the lines for the origin, and turning it into sort of a simpler kind of rotated, um, rotated grid. So it has essentially the same effect as long as you stay near r equals 2, theta equals pi force. If you go further away, then the two transformations are doing much different things.